Well, hello all. Today we are doing stoichiometry. Whatiometry? Stoichiometry. Isn't that a lovely word? When your parents ask, what did you do at school today? You could say we did stoichiometry. There's a lovely word you can use around the dinner table. Okay, so what is stoichiometry? It's all about the ratios in which things combine. Now to take it in something that we know a lot about, let's say we're going to make pancakes. I'm the pancake expert in our household. So if you're gonna make pancakes, you've gotta have a recipe and that's a ratio. So you take one cup of flour, one heaped teaspoon of baking powder, one egg, about two tablespoons or three of oil. Let's make it three of oil and one cup of milk. And then you can make your, um, and then you can make your um, pancake. So that's the ratios in which things combine, stoichiometry. Or when I was a kid, we used to make gunpowder. You see, there was no TV. And everyone used to celebrate Guy Fawkes, so we always used to have these fireworks and we could play with them, but um, that wasn't good enough. Emptying, breaking open the crackers and the fireworks and getting the gunpowder out of them, we had to make our own. So what we used to go is go from chemist to chemist, buying sulfur, saltpeter, and then we would, well, we'd go to one chemist and we'd buy the flowers of sulfur. Then we'd go to Mr. Morris, our chemist, and we'd buy the saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate. And then we go to my chimney and we'd scrape off the soot and we'd mix these three together in the correct proportion and we'd make gunpowder. That's stoichiometry, the ratio of mixing sulfur, saltpeter and carbon together. You mix it well and you can get yourself some gunpowder. Now today we're going to have even more fun. We're going to be talking about thermite. I couldn't believe my eyes. Thermite. On page one, 93. Hey, I need my glasses. Yeah, what page 193 of Study and Master. They talk about thermite. I got all excited. I got hot under the collar when they mentioned thermite because I remember from, we used to watch war movies and say you were going to blow up some guns, but you didn't have enough stuff. You were a commando. You were sneaking into the guns of Navarone and you wanted to melt their guns, but you couldn't carry a huge amount of explosive with you. How do you blow up a gun? It's a huge chunk of iron. But what they used to do is they used to make thermite and pour it into the mechanism of the gun. And thermite would weld the gun. It could melt the iron. With thermite, you can actually, if you light thermite on top of an engine block, it'll melt its way right through the, the engine block. That's how hot the reaction gets. Uh, when I saw on page 193 of Study and Master, they're going to talk about thermite. That's what I'm actually going to be talking about today the ratios in which you kind of make thermite. Now, obviously in study and master, they don't tell you how to make thermite, but I went and Googled it. You know, when I was young and we were making gunpowder, we didn't know the ratios in which to mix things. We just dried them out. But um, now you just go onto Google and it's, you mix um, three parts of metal rust, that's iron 203, with one part of aluminium, um, metal. Okay, so aluminium metal, where do you get aluminium, aluminium metal from? Well, you take a little hacksaw and you take some a chunk of aluminium and you start sawing and you get little um, grains of aluminium metal. You've got to be actually quite careful. I never realized that um, aluminium, aluminium metal can explode. <laughs> if you get enough of that fine dust in the air and there's a flame, you've got to be quite careful. You've got to work in a well ventilated area and don't let the concentration of aluminium dust rise and don't have a flame around. I mean, aluminium, we're talking your cans of soda. You saw those things up into a fine enough powder. You mix that with rust, iron rust, and you get thermite. Now, how do you set this whole thing off? Well, I Googled it. You buy those sparklers that you used to use at Guy Fawkes. <laughs> I remember, um, we always used to celebrate Guy Fawkes. It was a big thing in my day. And then I remember one year my dad said, this year we're not going to celebrate uh, Guy Fawkes. I thought, ah, he's just joking. He didn't. 
I was so deeply disappointed. But anyway, um, we used to get these little metal sparklers. Now that's how you do it. You, you mix up your iron oxide, which is just rust. You mix it with your um, aluminum very finely. You, you can take a file, you can just file your cans down and get uh, aluminum dust. Mix them carefully, one part of aluminum, three parts of um, rust. And then you stick a sparkler in, you light it and you get out of dodge. Because when that sparkler with its super heat gets into that mixture of aluminum and um, rust, iron rust, it's going to create enormous heat. They say 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyway, I, I don't know what that is in centigrade, but it's hot enough to melt your way right through an, uh, an engine block, apparently. <laughs> that's the measure of heat. So anyway, that's how we make thermite. So, um, what, but we're interested in looking at the equation for thermite, and then we're going to talk about limiting reagents. And you know, it's very interesting. I didn't know that there are actually 16 types of, of iron rust. I thought iron rust is iron rust. No, you've got to get the right type of rust. I'm sure in our laboratory, we've got Fe203. That is iron with a valency of three. Obviously, oxygen's got a valency of two, and they combine in the ratio of, of two ions, atoms, to three oxygen atoms. And that's stoichiometry, folks, the ratio in which iron combines with oxygen. Now, you can get FeO. That's iron's got a valency of two reacts with oxygen's got a valency of two and one iron with one oxygen feo that's another variation of rust but that's not the rust you want you want the the real mccoy you want the fe2 uh o3 yeah you want each iron must have a valency of three so you've got two ions both with a valency of three combining with three oxygens each with a valency of two so you've got three plus three is six 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, so you've got 3 oxygens with 2 ions. Now, I hope you guys all remember, I hope I'm not doing anything rude yet, um, that this is how we know that this represents the bonds or the valencies that atoms have. And stoichiometry is, say you've got 2 oxygen atoms, they don't float around like this in the air, unhooked. No, 2 oxygen atoms always float around in the air, calm bind. So we only get in real life O2. We don't get O by itself. Now there are some gases that do fly around by themselves. They are neon, argon, helium, all those in group 8 or 18 of the periodic table. Those guys don't have a valency at all. There's nothing sticking out. There's no bonds that they want to make. They just, they're called the noble gases. Noble because they don't associate with anything else not even themselves. So the noble gases will float around by themselves, boom, boom, and then you can talk about Ne or He by itself, but you don't ever use it in reactions because they're noble gases, they don't react. They don't mix with the peasants, the rest of the peasants on the periodic table. So nothing really can get them to combine. Okay, so you're never gonna use Ne or He in a chemical reaction because they don't react. But you're going to use oxygen and oxygen, valency two, valency two, the those two oxygen atoms, but they always combine into an oxygen molecule or O2. Now, if you have hydrogen, it's in group one. Everything in group one's got a valency of one. This hydrogen doesn't fly around with its little thing unhooked. It always links with another hydrogen. So we always get H2. And then 80% of the air is nitrogen. That's got a valency of three because it's in group five. You've got to know this, folks. And nitrogen doesn't float around unhooked to other atoms. Nitrogen always combines with nitrogen. And so we get N2. And if you had to look at it, it's got three covalent bonds holding two nitrogens together. And it floats around as an N2 molecule. So when we do chemical reactions, we've always got to write the way things are. Like we, in real life, we've got to write H2, O2, N2, F2, Cl2, and I'm sure there's another few others that are two of gases that 
join together and float around. So when we do chemical equations, we've always got to write how they occur in real life. Now I want to show you, um, there's some lovely websites. Let me just share the screen for a moment. We share screen and let's see if we can find, um, okay, there's our periodic table. So what we're gonna need to focus on is the approximate relative atomic mass this number at the bottom there. Okay, so for example, for hydrogen, it's one, for lithium, it's seven, for beryllium, it's nine, et cetera, for boron, it's 11, carbon, 12, 14, for nitrogen, and so on. That number is going to be important because if we say take, um, let's take carbon, we start counting our carbon atoms and we, we count for a few thousand years and we get to 6,024 times 10 to the 23, that means with six times 10, with six with 23 noughts after it, that's billions and billions and billions and billions of carbon atoms. But if we count for a few thousand years and we don't get stuck in the middle, oh, what's that number? I forgot. I've got to have to start again. No, if you count out six with 23 noughts after it of these carbon atoms, you will get exactly 12 grams of carbon. So instead of counting for thousands of years, counting out atoms, which would be impossible to do because you don't get tweezers that are that small, you rather just weigh out 12 grams of carbon and you've got one mole. So if you take Avogadro's number, that's 6,02 times 10 to the 23, you count out that number of particles, molecules, atoms, golf balls, it doesn't matter what you count out, that number is called Avogadro's number, and you will have a mole of those atoms, molecules, or golf balls. Okay, so 6,024 equals a mole. And then we're trying to invent our own science language. So this is our science language for moles. Okay, so let's just go back from here. Let's stop sharing. Okay. Are we joined by our friends at school? I see two participants, but I don't see anybody because I'm not sure they've turned on their video. I'm not sure they have a video. I'm just recording anyway. <laughs> I've started to record on moles and um, I'm recording and um so i'm just going to stop recording <laughs>